Canola School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Alberta Canola Producers Commission. I'm going to just show you here a nitrogen deficient plant and that's extremely deficient. I have seen it about that bad in the field sometimes. That's, that's very bad. And that is a sulfur deficient plant. So I mean it doesn't look quite as bad but that's not the point here. The point is, is that the symptoms here are much more consistent than you'll ever see with a phosphorus deficiency. And I want you to kind of describe those symptoms. What's the difference between these two other than the robust growth? I mean, that nit the nitrogen here is responsible for that robust growth. We don't have it here. But aside from the, the size, what are the other symptoms that you're seeing with the nitrogen deficiency? Lower leaves yellowing. Lower leaves are yellowing. This is textbook now and it's showing up very well. Lower leaves are yellowing. What leaves are yellowing on this sulfur deficient plant? Top ones. It's the top leaves that are, and that's because sulfur is not mobile in the plant, unlike nitrogen, which is. So then let's go a little bit further, because these are some classic symptoms, and that's exactly what the textbook would say is, it happens with cereal crops too. It's the upper leaves that yellow with sulfur. Um, what other symptoms that would you see on the sulfur deficient plant here? The cupping, again, very classic de uh, uh, deficiency symptom is that cupping, it doesn't, it's not 100% guarantee that it's sulfur. Uh, other symptoms. Sulfur deficiency in canola is one of the most fun to diagnose because it's... Or flowers have pods. Pods are just not filling, absolutely. What happens when pods don't fill? What does the plant do to try to recover? Make more, so it takes to flower, so it flowers forever. And that's an, also a symptom of it. Is this crop going to lodge? Probably not, because there's no weight at all. It's not filling up, and that's what you'll see in the field. Quite often when you diagnose sulfur deficiency in the field, you're going to see patches because it won't lodge beside a lodge crop. What about the color of the flowers? They're pale yellow. That's the, that's the telltale sign that you can see from your vehicle. You don't even have to go in the field, not that we would recommend it, but <laughs> that, that, that pale yellow shows up right from the road and that's a pretty classic symptom of sulfur deficiency as well. But the thing is, uh, by, unfortunately by the time you see that it's too late to, uh, to be doing anything. So, so Norm <laughs> was mentioning, um, one of the things that you look at, one of the things would be a telltale possibility of a, of a sulfur deficiency is it's in patches. Um, I've seen sulfur deficiency and that's generally what you see, it occurs in patches. I don't know, if there might be one in a million chance that you'd have a whole field that is deficient, but I, I think it'd be very, very rare. Uh, this picture, you know, probably exemplifies, you know, what you would see in a field. Now, again, if I was driving by this field, what am I going to do? I'm going to get out of the truck because there's something going on in here that's not right. But this wood is typical of what you find with, with sulfur deficiency. We know sulfur is very variable across the landscape. It's one of the most variable nutrients that's out there and we know that when we're soil sampling. And so that takes us to the next, sort of the next point. When we're soil testing, right, if we're just doing a conventional composite soil test where we've pulled 15 or 20 cores, you got to realize some of the cores are going to come from these areas of high sulfur levels. Maybe a couple of cores come from deficient areas, but when you mix it all together and submit it as a sample, it may come out still with very high sulfate levels. And so you may see on a soil test report, well, oh, crumb, I've got you know, 200, 300 pounds of sulfur per acre. I don't need to add any. Um, Norm, your recipe for uh, maintaining sulfur levels? Yeah, I, I, first of all, never grow canola without sulfur. Because if you do, if you ever had to diagnose a sulfur deficiency once, you'll never want to do it again because it's disheartening to see what five, seven dollars worth of sulfur could have done. But at least 10 pounds at the bare minimum always, uh, and that's if you think you've even got enough. If you don't think you've got enough, get up to 15, get up to 20 or 25 if you know you're deficient. So just always just use sulfur with canola. It's not worth the risk. So yeah, that, that addition of 15 pounds, I mean, what that does, it helps smooth out some of those areas that might be deficient, you know, kind of takes out some of that variability. Now, if you're in a VRT program, well, that might be something that you're going to look at is using ammonium sulfate or something and, and including that in your blend to try and, and correct, you know, the, those deficient areas. But again, that's another topic. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention about soil tests and sulfur is this, again, they're very variable, but the other thing is and uh, having worked down in Bob's country, down in southern Alberta, where we've got lots of salinity, I spent four and a half years working on soil salinity with Alberta agriculture. Most of the salts that we have in our soils in western Canada are not sodium chloride, not, not our typical table salt, 
all right? Most of the salts that we find in alkali patches that farmers refer to are calcium sulfate and magnesium sulfate salts, all right? So um, when we analyze that, it may, those salts may bump up the sulfate levels. And so again, you may have a situation where your soil test says I got all kinds of sulfate or even excessive. If you've got high sulfate levels, I always take a gander over at my soil quality parameters on a soil test report and I start looking at EC. That's your salt indicator of your soil test report. If I'm starting to see ECs of 1, 1.5 or 2, those sorts of things, that's indicating that we've got salts present in our sample. All right. Now, if there's an EC of 2 on your soil test report, that means that some areas of the field may have had as high as 4 or 5, other areas were 0.5. The point is there's salts present in the field and scattered throughout. So you have to recognize that maybe that high sulfate content that's on your soil test report is a reflection of some of the salts that are there. Okay? Um, magnesium sulfate? as itself, if it's in very low levels, is actually beneficial. I mean, uh, it provides both magnesium and sulfate. But what is it with salts? It's concentration. Once we start getting high concentrations, then the salt starts to compete with nutrients and interferes with nutrient uptake in the plant. So, um, like I say, whenever you're looking at some of those high sulfur contents, use that, you know, and be cautious with it because, again, some of that may be a reflection of, um, you know, of, of salt. One other thing I just wanted to point out, how quickly a nutrient deficiency can start to express itself. These plants were brought in on Sunday. These were grown hydroponically. This is one of the, uh, the, uh, the plants that came from the moderate nitrogen treatment. And you gotta realize it's, it's hydroponic, so this has not been fed for a couple of days, right? And do you, what do you notice? Look at the lower leaves are already starting to, so this plant is already starting to translocate nitrate from the lower leaves into the upper growth, and it's only been a couple of days because this has been grown hydroponically. So, you know, nutrient deficiencies can start to manifest themselves very, very quickly in certain environments. So, so just to quickly wrap up, the, the good thing about diagnosing a nitrogen and sulfur deficiency, you can correct these. You cannot correct the phosphorus as we've seen. These, just get in there with some nitrogen or some ammonium sulfate, get in soon enough, you can get this almost back to 100%. So that's kind of the good thing about getting early, getting at this early is it's quite easily correctable. I need